What's up, Danny? Hey, Danny. Hey, guys. We are back with another quarantine edition of Beer Time with Books and another Thirsty Thursday edition of Beer Time with Books. We've been on this Thursday grind the last few episodes. It's tradition. Uh, so, yeah, we have the third book of the second season now, which means that this is getting around to every host. We already did uh, my book, we did Jamie's book, and we're getting to Danny's book, Rabbit Run, which we are foreseeing is going to be an interesting discussion here today. I didn't I didn't fully know what I was getting into. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do just want to say to bring this back, we've talked about the book mug before. Uh, Jamie and I have this book mug in our house that... <laughs> It's become like a goal to read all of the books on this mug, and Rabbit Run is on the mug, which is part of what influenced you. I, is that correct, Danny? Yeah, I think that we were we were like talking about it at work like a few months ago, and you had the mug at work, <laughs> and we I was on Goodreads, like adding all the books to my Goodreads, and um. Now we're I, deep. Now we're deep into Rabbit Run. I, I am. We are deep into the reading list on the uh, on the mug, which is very arbitrary. <laughs> um, it is arbitrary, is- but we're making our way through. But before we get too deep into Rabbit Run, let's hit some of our classic corners here. We're gonna start with some. What are you drinking? Who wants to start? I'll go. Um, hi, this is Jamie. I am drinking an India Pale Ale from Odell Brewing Company. Um, It doesn't have a fancy name. It's just their IPA. Which is how you know it's good because it's just staple (laughs) IPA. It is just their IPA. Uh, It's pretty good. Brian had one of these last night and it's uh, a higher alcohol percentage than (laughs) we normally drink. So... That's. I think that'll be fuel for this conversation. <laughs> heck yeah, heck yeah. All right, Danny, what are you drinking tonight? I'm drinking another uh, Martin City Brewing Belgian Blonde. Um, mostly because... Oh, wait. <laughs> Sorry, that there funny. it is. There it is. Um, I um, Oh, it's a little, little fizzy from the pictures I was trying to take of it earlier. <laughs> I was moving it around. Um uh, I love the Belgian Blonde. Um, it's from the six pack I bought for the last episode, um, and uh, I'm the only one drinking it really because Will doesn't. Um, Will likes White Claw, and basically that's it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so the beer he stock does, is uh, yours. The beer stock is all you. He doesn't drink much, um, but when he does, it lately it's White Claw. <laughs> Um, just a casual Tuesday evening quarantine white claw. No laws with the white claws. Isn't that what the kids are saying these days? No laws with the white claws in quarantine. Absolutely. Uh, this is Brian. I am also drinking an Odell beer here. And I will be totally honest. I got this variety pack for one particular can, which is just so gorgeous i'll have to plug so we have our instagram now beer time with books and i've followed some of the brewers that we have on the show and odell keeps posting this one can from everybody and it's like the most beautiful beer can i've seen it's it's sipping pretty but it's a sour which we've talked about on the show before that uh, Danny, you like sours. We're iffy on them, but I'm going to give like it. Sours. I'm going to give it a go for uh, that can. But in the meantime, we're both drinking some IPAs. Uh, mine is the Double Dry Hopped Imperial IPA, um, and it says also at the bottom Chinook Galaxy. So I don't know if that's the actual name of it or if uh, it's just a little footnote is, on the beer. Is that there. like the? Is that like the series right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the chinook galaxy series and this one is also uh pretty strong i can't f- it's an 8.2 yeah 8.2 percenter so uh we are having some interesting discussions today so that's what we're drinking and then also before we move on we're just going to do a quick corner here on what are some recent pieces of media you've been consuming so we'll just hit back same way we started jamie all right. Um, I am basically it's all, it's all the same. Uh, I finally finished the audiobook I was listening to, uh, The Sympathizer by Viet Tan Nguyen. Nguyen. 
Um, I finished that today, which I'm happy with. Uh, and I really, really enjoyed the ending. I think I talked about it was slow to get into to start. Um, but the ending was really, really good. So highly recommend. I'm still reading The Buried Giant by Kazuo Ishiguro. Uh, I'm almost done with it. I hope I'll finish it in the next few days. Um, and I've been playing a lot of Animal Crossing. That's that's most of my life right now. Animal Crossing has been a great quarantine activity, to be completely honest. Yeah, it's, it's so calming. Um, yeah, I've been playing a lot of Animal Crossing. And my, my Animal Crossing house now is to the point where it very much has my personality. Like, it's got <laughs> a little typewriter and a sewing machine and... Oh, this giant record player. Oh, it's so good. Jamie, Jamie quilts. <laughs> Even in Animal Crossing. <laughs> Even in Animal Crossing, I quilt. So that's most of what I've been doing. Nice. Danny? Um, I uh, burned through the two seasons of Killing Eve that are on Hulu. Um, I pretty much watched the second season in one day. Well, I watched <laughs> six, I watched six of the eight episodes like two Saturdays ago, and I made myself watch the last two on Sunday. I easily could have just watched them on Saturday. Um, I needed to space it out a little. Um, Killing Eve is phenomenal, and I highly recommend it. <clears throat> um, I um, cannot wait for the third season um, to come out on the services. Um, and um because i think it's out i think it's out coming out like live like right now um so um i why well, I, yeah i basically started and finished that in between the last episode and now um i also recently um started reading on earth were briefly gorgeous by ocean wong um that has been recommended from um by a lot of people in like my different just like corners of the internet and circles and friends have read it and so i'm int i was interested and in, it's a super fast read it's really sad um but it's really good um i'm almost halfway done um and uh oh will and i are watching the crown um which i was yelling about to jamie and brian via group <laughs> chat earlier um because we've made it to season three and i have feelings everything has changed <laughs> every actor is different i mean i think it's a cool idea i just think that they probably should have <laughs> I think they. I understand the the point, but behind changing the actors, listen, Claire Foy cannot age, you know, as much as she should in just the span of a few years of filming. However, however, they all look like they've aged four hundred thousand years in the span of what's supposed to be like two years. So I have a bone to pick with the producers of The Crown, but I like the new cast. I just really miss Claire Foy. Um, but we traded Claire Foy for Hel Helena Bonham Carter, who is great. And so, uh, love her. Um, we're three episodes into the third season. Um, so we're, we're almost done. <laughs> um, the, the only reason we're not going faster is because Will, uh, likes to watch them slower than I do. <laughs> um, I've also been listening to, uh, um, Selena Gomez's most recent album, um, called Rare, uh, Boyfriend. <laughs> in particular on that album is uh, a banger as they say we're gonna just start out this spotify playlist now then, <laughs> starting with this recommendation um yeah that's my content cool uh yeah for me i finally finished all the king's men by robert penn warren uh i told jamie this would be one that i'd want to potentially Reread later. This was my audiobook of the two reads I had started that were fairly long for quarantine reads. Uh, I kind of want to read it in a physical book. I was taking a lot of hikes while I was reading it, but it just started getting so. Uh, all the characters got so intertwined by the end that I want to go back and kind of see where those different. Um, paths crossed earlier in the novel, but it was very fascinating. 1930s. Uh, depression era political novel apparently based off of a senator uh, in Louisiana so um, upon learning about that too it was pretty interesting about you know how much of this corruption actually potentially had grounding in reality so 
Oh, yeah, that was a pretty good read. Um, and then also we've been watching Succession on HBO, which has been nuts. I'm really anxious because I remember when the second season finale came out that, like, it was literally everywhere. Uh, so I'm just anxious to see what happens there. But the first season and a half have been uh, really, really good. And then also, lastly, on a video game uh, Fallout 76 for any Fallout fans. It came out in 2018, got a lot of hate for a lot of reasons. They just released a new update to it, and it kind of feels fresh again. So I'm dipping back into that, and uh, it's a post apocalyptic world in the middle of an apocalyptic world, which is <laughs> fantastic. But uh, yeah, and that's been. Uh, a good time and then yeah animal crossing jamie and i are sharing an island and we're 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 doing it up right now jamie's out there terraforming the world so (laughs) so yeah that's been the recent media we have been consuming on the pod um i have a video game addendum i don't play video games uh at all uh will play a lot of um games on pc but um I play none, and uh, recently um, I created my own little farm in Stardew Valley. Oh, uh, hell yeah. It's and so it's, good. it's cute, and I'm just planting and fishing and <laughs> meeting friends, and it's so fun. Oh, you're going you're gonna to get deep on that. It goes I, so deep, Danny. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a little I, – I started because Will told me that it was – a calming you can just plant and make money and kind of not you know do whatever and but i there's already drama with the people that i'm meeting and oh, there's I, drama i don't feel chill um <laughs> you can get married though you can you can find a spouse i know you can get married um but every man that i have met so far has been like what do you want every time i try to talk to them so <laughs> Things are maybe presents. maybe uh, yeah. I need to, I need to uh, buy their affection. Anyway, I've been playing that and I like it. Nice. Well, that is the recent media we've been consuming. So now we're going to be moving into the uh, interesting discussion we have been looking forward to here. This is the third book of the second season, Rabbit Run by John Updike. Danny, take it away. All right. (laughs) So I'll start with a summary. Um, This book is about a, like, I think he's around 26. Yeah. um, Year old guy. um, And he is married. He has a child and his wife is pregnant. His wife's name is Janice. Um, We gather from, like, the first few chapters that, or I guess first few pages, this book has no chapters, which is interesting. Um, uh, we gather that he was like a high school basketball star. Um, he, um, is currently a, um, salesperson for something called the Magi Appeal. Um, and, uh, The Magi Appeal gets referenced so many times. Yeah, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. Um, and, um, we, you know, learn that he... I mean, doesn't he doesn't really love his job. He also doesn't really love his life. Um, he he um, uh, we meet his wife um, when he comes home uh, at the beginning of the book from playing like a where he like inserts himself into like a pickup basketball game with like some like young uh, like teens. Um, <laughs> the youths. <laughs> and yeah, some youths um, and. He gets home and I think that his wife, uh, I think the implication, or maybe it's obvious, um, his wife uh, is, has been drinking and I think the implication is that she's an alcoholic or maybe she just, um, maybe Rabbit, uh, the main character, um, thinks that she's an alcoholic. Um, His name is Harry, um, but his nickname uh, in high school um, was Rabbit and he continues to kind of go by that nickname. Um, And... um, he basically just, you know, can't really stop talking about how much he, like, resents 
his wife and his life and um, how just like sinfully boring she is and how how boring everything is. Um, and and like, ugly. Don't forget yeah, ugly. He, yeah, he lots also, of ugly talk. He also, um, he cannot talk about a woman without referencing her looks. And 90% of the time, it's negative. Um, when it's positive, it's offensive. Uh, and... Um, he also like can't really fathom like when a woman is attractive. He's almost offended by like the audacity of a woman being attractive, but he also like requires them to be attractive in order to the double standards are rampant. Um, so yeah, he thinks his wife is ugly. Uh, he thinks she's boring. Um, and he uh, is basically supposed to go pick up his son from um, uh, his in-law's house and um, he instead, um just like drives for a long time like for several hours just kind of like in a midlife crisis except he's 26 type situation he just drives away and decides he's going to leave his family um when he when he decides to turn around um he catches up with his high school basketball coach um can you remind me his name do you guys remember his name tothero or something like tothero. that yeah tothero tothero or... tothero um, yeah. he um he uh, is also seems to be kind of like um, a person who like is living back in his glory days of coaching, um, just as Rabbit is living back in his glory days of uh, being on the basketball team under this coach. Um, so he stays with him in his like sad little house for a few days. He goes out to dinner um, with uh, Tothro and. Um, what is presumably Tothro's like mistress? Is he married, or maybe it's just a woman he's dating? I think it's his prostitute. Yeah, I don't think he he's. I don't married. think they're really dating though. Oh, they're just fully okay. She's fully a um, a sex worker. Great. Um, so <laughs> is Ruth also? Yes. I At the beginning, that. with that she yeah she like says that she is, but then later says like I didn't really like it and I didn't do it that much. So right. And then, and then also at the end, she gets a brief moment of talking about, I don't know. It, yeah, it we gets get into like, the history inside. of it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, so Tothero, um takes him to dinner at a, um, at a, at a Chinese restaurant, um, which as you can imagine is also full of racist stereotypes. Um, like there were times when he was talking about it where I was just like, you just fully didn't need to say that. Like you didn't need to, bring that in you didn't need to bring it up like so unnecessary um i don't know if he was just like trying to set the tone of just like general 1960 racism or what um but they're at the chinese restaurant uh and then rabbit ends up going home with ruth um the um other prostitute um and um he like stays a few days with her and um or for a while he stays with her um they sleep together and um he also has a lot of feelings about her looks and her body and her attractiveness. Um, proceeds to call her fat several times when then later it's revealed that she weighs like 140 pounds or something absurd. Um, he cannot stop talking about how fat she is, um, which is like a whole issue in itself anyway. Um, yeah, he, uh, he can't talk about women unless he's commenting on their looks uh, or like their usefulness to him. Um, and... He also meets um, with, he runs into the uh, the pastor of his church, of a church. I don't know if it's his church. Um, Eccles. Um, and uh, he ends up having kind of conversations um, and playing golf with um, this pastor for like the, the following uh, few weeks. Um, they talk about like atheism and God. Rabbit says he believes in God um, and but also, like, it's, he seems to kind of have, like, a faith questioning um, during this as well. Um, Especially because Ruth doesn't. And that was an interesting um, conversation at the time that they kind of ran into. Yeah, it, it seemed like when they first had that conversation that, like, he had actually never thought about whether he did or not, really. Um, and it was, like, the first time that, would, like, he, you know, Ruth was kind of like, oh, like, you do believe in you do believe in God like you would and he was like what you don't yeah it kind of <laughs> um, makes him double down a little bit in having it challenged kind of which was an interesting thing um 
Yeah, so he um, he has met with uh, Cothro. He's met with Eccles. Um, he plays. He continues to play golf with him and kind of just like lounge around and like live in um, Ruth's place. And then he gets a job <clears throat> like gardening. Um, and he's kind of just like living his his uh, you know second life away from his pregnant wife and their son. Um, he gets a little bit of insight uh from uh Eccles as to like how Janice is doing um but that's pretty much all we hear from about her for like the whole first half mm-hmm. my is that am I missing anything yeah um Ruth is also pregnant now do we know that oh what full fully Ruth is pregnant Wait, oh, I guess I guess I kind of recall her talking about. It's like the last few pages that we read, where she's talking about how she she's doesn't... super tired. Yeah. She has cravings. Okay. She knows that she should have gotten up after they had sex and like cleaned out, and, and she and didn't. Didn't. She, didn't she say specifically something about missing her yeah, period? She, she okay, missed her yeah. Period. Fully, Ruth is I, pregnant. No, I what, I didn't want to say. Any, I was worried that I was going to spoil something, but yes, definitely she's okay, pregnant. Yeah. Ruth is pregnant at this point. Um, yeah, she think, keeps crying. Yeah. Like she's yeah. Oh yeah, because she was really emotional at the pool. Yeah. And, yeah. But yeah, I think that's that's pretty much where where we're at with the with the story. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's. <laughs> All right. Um. I want to. I want to just hear your guys' initial feelings first. Just like just. It just initial feelings. Like a few seconds. I have feelings. Um, Brian and I kept like almost talking about this novel throughout the time that we were both reading it because we were reading about the same parts at the same time. Like every few days, we'd be at the same page number. Um, and I kept saying, I really don't know how I feel about it, but I know that I hate Rabbit. Like, I know (laughs) that I hate him so much, but I don't know how I feel about the book itself because I cannot tell. And this is like reading it from a, a 2020 perspective and not a 1960 perspective, but like, I cannot tell for the life of me if John Updike is self aware in his writing. Um, when, when I like come at it from the perspective of like almost my brain kept going to like watching Mad Men, like Mad Men is a show that has so much sexism and racism and terrible characters, but you know that it's being critical. Yeah. And so like, if I read it through that viewpoint, I like it. But if I read it through the viewpoint (laughs) that John Updike is, is rabbit. Which I think maybe he is. Which I think that he is because for context, it was 1960 when he wrote this and he was 28. 28! Yeah, and it does sound very much like like I'm an angsty boy who's kind of depressed and I want to relive my glory days and why isn't every person in the world catering to me in order to do that? Like, it's very... it's It's so... Oh, there are so many parts that are so, like, cringy and, like, praising this terrible person that Rabbit is. Um, but I I also kept trying to read it from the perspective of, like, as if I were watching Mad Men. <laughs> of, like, this is yeah. bad, but it's... The story is kind of enjoyable. Like, I, I haven't felt like it's hard to pick up the book and read. Yeah, definitely the progression of it because at the same time, like even in this time period, it's well known that this is a bad thing that mm-hmm. Rabbit is doing, regardless of how John Updike is writing the the virtues or lack of of Rabbit. At this time, what he is doing is bad. Yeah, definitely. What he's doing is considered bad, but also Rabbit doesn't think it's bad. So that's where I'm like, does John Updike (laughs) think it's bad? Um, Yeah, those are my main feelings. Like, I really, I feel very torn on it because he is a terrible person. Um, The moment that really messed it up for me, and again, this might change in the second half, so I don't know. But the scene where Rabbit has sex with Ruth 
the first time starts out as like very rapey like very oh yeah that was section was so bizarre so gross and she's like actively upset and telling him to just leave and like he paid her and she's there's an agreement so it's kind of consensual but whatever um but it's very gross and she very much like wants him to leave but and so i was like okay this is critical because ruth is the critical person here like she is giving us the perspective of the person who like realizes that rabbit is a shitty person you know but then suddenly he is the only man in the past however many months who could make her orgasm (laughs) and i was like oh no is it critical is it bad yeah it was it was very like there was so much praise uh, for himself Mm -hmm. and then i was also like rooting for ruth and then it was like, oh, wait, she only exists to prove that he is sexually competent. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, nah, why do I don't like that? <laughs> yeah, I really, I was so upset when she, when she orgasmed. <laughs> <laughs> I was so upset because I was like, no, this is not realistic. He sucks. <laughs> wow, quotes out of context. <laughs> I was so upset. When yeah. she orgasmed, <laughs> it was it was it was one of the few times where I was not rooting for a woman to orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, how do you feel? <laughs> well, I'm just going straight off of that. As a man, as, <laughs> as a man. <laughs> yeah, not not playing that card much today on this one. <laughs> um, Yeah, I don't know. This book, as Jamie has kind of alluded to, makes me feel very conflicted. Um, I'll first start off with a comparison that I had briefly brought up to Jamie, but we wanted to save it a little bit, is this book reminded me a lot of The Catcher in the Rye, but but as, as a different in respect to how we are supposed to perceive the characters because Holden he he has some sympathy to his character because he's a child and potentially has like mental disorders or is angsty or whatever there's a, like it's not that Holden is like even that great either but like there seems to be some justification into Holden's character but with Rabbit there doesn't seem to be that he is just like the the angst doesn't really have as much of an explanation there. And so like that again, just, it makes me not like rabbit specifically as a character, but as to the writing of the book itself, there are a few interesting parts to it, especially when we're not that focused on rabbit and especially when we're not focused on rabbit with women, which unfortunately (laughs) is a significant portion of the book. But, but you know, when we're starting to get into these other items where rabbit is thinking about religion or where he's thinking about capitalism in this time, and it starts to delve into these ideas that, are very new for this time period just because you know this is a post-war period a pre-60s period it's a very interesting point in time where a lot of these ideas are coming about from you know looking at a lot of other studies of literature from this time that you know these are ideas that people commonly cite as like humans being able to think of more than just their survival in regards to like the war and the things they have to do to put food on the table and to keep the country running. Like he gets to think outside of that. And I think that that's part of what it is of like, Oh, rabbit is breaking away from this mold that he has to like provide for his family or whatever else. But that doesn't justify him doing what he does anyway. So that's the part I don't like that rabbit just definitely seems super shitty, but the stuff that he delves into to kind of like question society like with random things of when he's in the car and he's like 
thinking about the different advertisements or the magic peel or whatever it's called and all these things it seems to be a more critical look at a capitalist society when like at this point in time you're having these picture perfect ads in the 60s with these housewives that even talks about in here that he's like what the hell's up with all of this like that's this is a bizarre society my life's not like that. <laughs> well, yeah, but yeah but it's like this is a bizarre thing to live in and then also him getting into these conversations where he's making uh the minister question his own faith to some degree not that he's questioning him to become a non-believer but to like question his perception of what hell is or like all of these different things where he's really poking at something that doesn't feel like it's been that explored in this time period like all of that is very interesting but like again it, it that doesn't amount to the vast majority of this book and a lot of what rabbit perceives as being like alpha in some way is just like continually like cringy i suppose for lack of a better word reading it now so that's kind of where i'm at with it that like i still find it very interesting and i'm not ready to write the book off especially because as i told jamie earlier this week i need to know what the ending is to reveal how we think updike feels about rabbit it's not looking great <laughs> to be quite honest but but that's what i think is going to be interesting uh, to see, because I think getting to the end game here will reveal a lot about what the purpose of this book really is, I suppose. So um, that kind of keeps me um, chugging forward at this point. Yeah, I had similar feelings. Um, <laughs> because, okay, because you're like, if you read this as like a 2020 human, feminist, <laughs> like, just, I mean, a regular person, if you like read these, you know, these, some of the, some of the way that Rabbit speaks about women to like any s mostly self-respecting person, like they would be mm -hmm. like, that's not a good way to talk about someone. Right. Um, <laughs> most, mostly. Um, but so like, if you read this just fully from like a 2020 like lens it's so bad it's just like this is not this is like this is probably worth it the the content is like can be could be like done away with um but like i do think you have to put a like Mad Men esque lens on it and like understand like his perspective as like a 28 year old um writing this it did remind me a lot of holden caulfield um actually i was reading and i read a few articles about this um and um, one of the articles ex uh, um, described Rabbit as an older and less articulate Holden Caulfield, and I was like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> because it's true, like, you, yeah. you actually feel a lot of sympathy. Holden is a sympathetic character um, because of all the reasons you mentioned, Brian, but, um, but Rabbit is not really, like, I don't really feel that bad for him. Um, no, because yeah, like he, even him leaving, like just the line that that it took for him to take that step to leave was just like his wife asking for cigarettes. It was nothing like. Yeah. And, and his and basically like the line was basically like, you know, him realizing that like his wife had aged over the uh -huh. course of their marriage. And he was just like, oh, she's ugly now. And it's just as it presents like, you know. He mentions, just side note, he mentions how old they both were when they got married. She's like three or four years younger than him. He, she's like 23, maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and he's so talking this is about not like her a, aging. This is, this is not like a, this is not like a, a 50, you know, 45 year old situation. Like she is like 22 and, uh, and he like it's talking about her just like you know aging and like you know the way she's not like a spry little 18 year old which i guess is what he want i don't know right it, not that this makes it better but i i did think it was interesting <laughs> with mrs smith where she was talking about her son dying in world war ii that she called him old at 40 so like that's another like not again it doesn't uh, justify thinking about this any yeah no, no 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 but also yeah. like the 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 average age i suppose or lifespan even would also be vastly different but that still is like 
way too young to be yeah, thinking any of that anyway. Twenty two is like thirty five. Yeah, and that would still, still exactly, that. exactly. But I but I did find so, that interesting that that Mrs. Smith line specifically when I got to that I was like, oh shit, that's that's an interesting thing yeah, for her to have yeah. said that forty was old. But again, it doesn't change that that is a stupid thing. I took a picture of that quote. It's like that. It's one of the first pages, like first few pages of the novel, and it says. Just yesterday, it seems to him, she stopped being pretty. With the addition of two short wrinkles at the corners, her mouth has become greedy, and her hair has thinned, so he keeps thinking of her skull (laughs) under it. Danny's eyes roll in the middle of this reading. Oh my god. Just yesterday. Like, like, even if you were reading this about a literal grandmother, like, you, <laughs> you, you would, you would be like, "That's pretty rude. We probably shouldn't talk about people that way." Meanwhile, she is younger than I am, and I also kept comparing, like, him calling like Ruth fat, and then she, you know, she realized that, like, it, it, it's revealed later that she's just like, uh, like a very like <laughs> spry, like thin woman. <laughs> I think it's kind of like she's oh, curvy. Oh she's cute. Like yeah, she thick. It, 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 and today she <laughs> she double C. It was just thick. So, <laughs> she double C. I really thick. in That's order to like is. in order to like keep my sanity while reading this, you ha- you really have to like put another lens on it. I have to take off a lens and I have to put on <laughs> another one because because the like there is you know like the I re- like I'm I'm really engaged. I I actually like was I, I read this. I finished it like several days ago normally like i try to space it out and like read it um finish the books closer to when we do the podcast but i actually finished it a few days ago because i was i was really interested i I really wanted to know what happened i was really like i was really in this world of him and ruth and his his new kind of life um so there's so many good things to say about like the pros and eat but even though like even the this is where i have a hard time because there were some like we were talking earlier about the reviews of um, <laughs> of, the, of the like the newspapers. Um, we have a few reviews in, in your book and in my in my copy of the book. Um, Shout like out the Kansas Washington City Star. <laughs> that, so so like the Washington Post says, brilliant and poignant by his compassion, clarity of insight, and crystal bright prose. Yes, all true, fabulous. <laughs> Updike, Updike makes rabbit sorrow his and our own, and I'm just like. <laughs> You were so Our close. own sorrow. You could have stopped there. <laughs> oh fucking rabbit God. sorrow is not my own. Go back to your damn hot wife. <laughs> fucking rabbit. Um, and then like the the Kansas City Star. A lot like. All right, I'm gonna frame these reviews really fast because I read I read another article about the uh, the the first the very first round of reviews that came out um, when this book was published, and they were they were all just very like they just loved Updike. Updike was like being praised as like I'm sure people would still consider him like one of the great American authors. He was being compared to like Henry James. Like he was I I I his his writing is 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 beautiful. His prose is I love I love um uh Ruth's when we get insight into Ruth's point of view. Oh I love Ruth's that was amazing. I loved Ruth's part like when he's not writing as a man, it, it's it's so great. And even those little parts you talked about too, Brian. Um, like there are there are like very uh, poignant, like self aware parts. But I I do truly wonder like if if like those are just like brief moments of clarity, or if he is if this is satirical, or if he's like fully in this. I am rabbit, and like I am feeling. I can imagine feeling this way. You, you know what, though? Th- this is something that I did want to kind of bring up is, you know, you you talk about the Ruth chapter there. And, the, you know, we all just had some agreement of how well written that was. And it was a good outside perspective of not just getting into Rabbit's head where we all feel uncomfortable being there. There are multiple <laughs> wide <laughs> eyes <laughs> across the table. Uh there are multiple times that other characters get involved that I felt that kind of self-awareness creeping in without having to justify it in the way that rabbit does like rabbit sometimes has these self-aware things. And then a sentence or two later, it gets back into this, like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like chill out for just a second. But like, 
But like Mrs. Smith, for instance, like the stuff that she talked about seemed very aware and mature without mm-hmm. like without it seeming like it's an immaturity of Updike within his own writing. Uh, it seems like the immaturity does come from Rabbit to some degree is how I kind of started to see it, which I wouldn't say that that's totally true because for somebody to even be able to write this well as a Rabbit character, there is still presumably some immaturity in there to some degree to be as biting as, as Rabbit can be, I suppose, is what yeah. I'm getting at. But but with a lot of those other characters, specifically Mrs. Smith, specifically uh, with Ruth, to somewhat... Uh, to some degree with um, Eccles and his wife. I just feel like there are certain instances that we get this like total clarity within a character that again has this commentary on a lot of uh, common parts of society in this era that that kind of keeps me thinking of like, you know, maybe there is something to this theory that Updike is is writing from the perspective that we're hoping that he writes it from. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what I kept feeling with some of those other characters. The only thing that's stopping me from feeling that way, because I also had all those same moments, <laughs> but still, Ruth, like, Ruth's section is so much better, like, inner monologue-wise than Rabbit's is, definitely, but she still right, is, like, fully true. praising Rabbit that's and being true. like, wow, this yeah, man this- who forced himself into my house. Like, yeah, I... This book, that's true. It fully does not pass the Bechdel test. No, I, so. I, yeah, no, I definitely don't think that overall, like, that he has this total clarity. I think that there's still some issues with it, but, like, I think that there's definitely a lot more, especially for thinking of this book being written in the 50s and coming out in 1960s that it's like wow like as much as ahead of the time as you could be he is to some degree while still being trapped in a time that was like obviously super horrible and had bad standards toward women and minorities and 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 anything else like you know that is still a huge issue but i just felt like it was cleared up a lot more with some of those side characters but that's true the root stuff that is concerning it's it's almost good. That's how I kept feeling of like being like, I almost think that this is very critical, but to a point, suddenly Ruth is just like, oh, oh, gee, that <laughs> rabbit guy, I just, oh, you know? I'm, I love him and I don't even, I shouldn't, I, I don't know. Like, she, you know <laughs> I forgive any- all of the men before rabbit because. Yeah, oh my God. That, uh, yeah, yeah, I... <laughs> I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I have uh, I have a few I have a few quotes um, that I want to read from a few really good articles, um, and uh, and what do I want to start with? There were so I wrote a billion down. Um, so there's a there's an article there's a fabulous article from the New Yorker that's called "How Women See How Male Authors See Them," and. Um, you know, I, I, it made me wonder, like, I've read a lot of these articles where it's just like almost, it's like, it's like a, it's like a trope. It's a joke now where it's like, you know, reading the way that like male authors write women, you know, I was, in some, I was sometimes going to bring up the joke on Twitter of like a male author describing a woman. And then it's just like the worst thing ever. Cause I it's literally like just like, she, her breasts breasted breastily across, the, you know, it's very like, it's, it's very, uh, I, I think, uh, in the comments, please correct me if I'm wrong, this feels like uh, like he wrote the book on how, women, how men write, like in a, in a modern sense, like how men write, like wrote women for like uh, a time. Um, because there's, there's a quote uh, in, from this article. In Rabbit Run, John Updike makes a gallant attempt to salvage a shimmer of desirability from the pregnant frame of Harry Angstrom's wife. (laughs) Standing there trying to get the waist of the skirt suit to link at her side, the tops of her breasts swollen with untaken milk, pushing above her bra, she does have a plumpness, a fullness that called to him, Updike concedes generously. And when a woman's perceived unattractiveness cannot be transmuted into attractiveness, it is typically met with bafflement and and suppressed irritation. (laughs) Like... It feels, I, I almost like, um, like I was, I, I tried to read the book as though I was reading it as somebody in like the 60s because um, 
because it feels like a very tired trope now. Like we're a pat, we are fully hope mostly past like men writing like women this way, people writing women this way, and um, or needing feeling the need to write women this way. We're past people being so blatantly, um, you know, uh, blatant in their like objectification of like women, even in books. Like I was cringing at parts. Um, but I want to, that's a good segue into, um, uh, how do we feel about Janice's character so far? And like, do we think we're going to get any insight into her in the second half? Do we think we're going to get like a Ruth-esque chapter, um, or section, um, from Janice? Like, uh, do you think she's playing, what kind of role do you think she's playing? I hope so. In my most hopeful view of this novel, I think that we will get a perspective from Janice that is critical and interesting and makes her a more nuanced character, um, like a three-dimensional character. But right now, she is fully one-dimensional. Um, and I don't know that I feel super optimistic about getting more dimensions to her because she really is she's just like every description that we have of her is she's an alcoholic who sits in her like lazy boy essentially in front of the tv she doesn't really cook she doesn't work she gets her money from her dad um and what's she even good for like she's not even that sexually adventurous she wouldn't let rabbit see her naked for a long yeah time. probably because of the way that he talks about women probably <laughs> but like that is the view that we have of her and i i hope that we get more than that because i think that probably there's a lot going on with her but i i don't know that i would say i'm optimistic about getting that viewpoint I hope so. Yeah, I think um, the one thing that keeps me optimistic about getting her perspective is the introduction of Eccles, uh, because we continue to see with their conversations that he still asks about her and he hasn't yet gotten a full picture. And it seems that Eccles is kind of avoiding getting that specific, but just by the mere fact that he's in there and there is a tie that isn't just him coming face to face with her. Cause we didn't have Eccles or even know of his presence until over halfway or maybe halfway into this first half mm -hmm. that like he was introduced, uh, hopefully for that purpose to help build us up to a reunion with Janice to some degree, whether it's a good one or not, whether it comes to confrontation or whatever else. Uh, but just from the mere fact that there is still a tie to Janice that isn't just Rabbit's memory at this point. Um, so, like, I think that that'll definitely play a, a big part. Um, and that will be interesting to see where their relationship goes because it's not like we have any indication that their meetups are going to end anytime soon because they still have these Tuesday golf trips and whatever else. Uh, like they'll still be seeing each other. And it seems like Eccles from what we have heard, doesn't necessarily get around to the problems of everyone in his congregation. As we had heard from his conversations with his wife, that he should be, calling on people that are n maybe needing his help more than some dumbass like rabbit, <laughs> but he does have this focus on rabbit. And so that would make me think that this would be like a pet project for Eccles. Like I need to do something here. Yeah, yeah. But the only thing that with that, that I'm still not optimistic about is that like Eccles is in contact with Janice, but Eccles is also in a seemingly very unhappy marriage and also seems pretty misogynist. Mis <laughs> <laughs> what did I just say? Misogyn misogynistic. Misogynistic. Um, like he... That scene of him at home just made me so sad. 
Yeah, like, it was I, a very, it was a very sad, uh, in a similar vein of just like a, a depressed, like, uh, you know, I don't know, like going nowhere, like marriage. Yeah, like I don't know that, I think that he is, Eccles is sympathetic to Janice simply for the like social construct of marriage not necessarily for Rabbit yeah. being, like, a terrible he, person. Because Eccles yeah, fully kind of, is, like, my wife... So, like, he's yelling at her because the kid is interrupting his, like, daytime nap. Like, <laughs> I don't... Yeah, which, by the way, he was napping instead of playing golf. So, like, you know, his schedule doesn't seem too strenuous. <laughs> uh, and it... I mean, but it, it also just... I don't know, um... Yeah, it, it reeked of the same kind of like unhappy marriage vibe. So and 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 Eccles more than anything like pities Janice. Uh like he feels bad for her because because like she's a pitiful character, like not because he thinks that, you know, like necessarily like that what Rabbit is doing is wrong. Yeah, it's not that he like views her as a human being he's just I feel like his perspective is like 1950s 1960s like the sanctity of marriage and you cannot leave your wife but like I think that he also kind of hates Janice like every time every time he talks about Janice he's like I don't know she seemed fine (laughs) yeah I, so I don't, just I don't, hanging out, waiting for you to come back, huh? Yeah, like, that's I also, don't know that so, that makes me optimistic. That's also an interesting contrast, though, to the way that Tothero talks about Janice. Um, because Tothero actually seems like, like, I mean, I don't know. Maybe this is a, uh, like, a false dichotomy that I'm drawing, but, like, I was seeing Eccles as like, you know, maybe a little bit the angel on Rabbit's shoulder and as a direct like foil or like contrast to him is Tothero who is like essentially what Rabbit could end up as if he continues Mm -hmm. on the path that he is on. Um, Because Tothero lives in like, uh, he even, he kind of even like owns it. Like they get to his house and he's like, welcome to my mansion. And it's like this (laughs) shitty little like uh, attic. Um, And like, like he, even Rabbit like sees Tothro for being kind of like a pathetic figure. He doesn't really think of Eccles that way. Um, even but, you know, like there are times when like Tothro is talking about he's like obsessed with talking about the basketball season, and he even like misremembers things as better than they were. Um, and and Rabbit even you know he spends a lot of time thinking about how good he was at basketball. Um, but he doesn't, but even, even when Tothero is like going further, he's like, oh God, like this guy seems a little, <laughs> you know, like he seems a little, he seems a little sad. So like when Rabbit is thinking that Tothero is sad, you know that it's like very sad. And <laughs> so I don't know. I wonder, like, did you guys draw any kind of conclusion, conclusions about, uh, about a Tothero? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Why are you pointing? And, at me? and final thoughts too. We're getting about there. Oh, yeah, I mean, I was gonna ask. So, so final conclusions about uh, Tothro versus Eccles. I was drawing like kind of a. I was kind of drawing like a um, a contrast between them. Um, and yeah, final thoughts. Um. Yeah. I. I also saw that of kind of like the foil character. Um. And I, I was a little bit optimistic about Tothero uh, as well when he first showed up because he was very much like, ah, oh, poor Janice. Like, you just you just need to get some sleep. Like, we'll talk about it in the morning. We'll go yeah. see her, whatever. <laughs> but then we, we'll when, talk about it in the morning. <laughs> when he woke him up, he was like, no, nah, we're going out. I got these girls. And one of them's kind of fat, but it'll be okay. We're gonna go see some hookers, and it was just so not. Rabbit was like, "Wait, I kind of thought we were gonna go see Jit," and he was like, "Nope, we're going to lunch at the Chinese buffet with Ruth and her sad friend." Yeah, who he then like falls in love with. Like, I don't know, I don't know where this is going. I none of the men make me feel optimistic in this story. Um. <laughs> Therefore, I don't know that Rabbit will grow. 
that's how I feel. I I don't know. I really don't know if Eccles or Tothero, I don't know if he's going to come back. I assume he will. Um, I don't know if either of them will be helpful or help Rabbit see his... Uh, the... The error the, of his ways. The error of his ways. <laughs> his faults. There are three more books in this series, so I'm assuming not. Yeah, I suspect <laughs> that the men don't have any faults in any of these books. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if I have any other final thoughts. I'm very, I am very excited to read the second half. Like, I'm very interested to see what happens. I just don't think I'm gonna be happy about it. <laughs> 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 So, uh, that's how I feel going into the second half. Brian? Brian takes a huge swig of beer. Oh, as a man. As a man, let me know. <laughs> um, yeah, the Tothero Eccles thing, it, it is interesting seeing them as a dichotomy, uh, but also... I agree that they're both flawed in in large ways that Eccles like has this barrier to his own flaws because of his relationship to the big guy upstairs um, that he's kind of just like, well, you know, with God, all things are possible. Um, so I don't know. It, I think that it like shelters and raises his status a little bit, but also like does keep him asking questions and does raise these philosophical questions with rabbit that I think will be interesting. The only problem with that is rabbit seems to be influencing Eccles more than Eccles <laughs> is influencing <laughs> rabbit. So, so rabbit, you've got to stop. Yeah, so, so that's something that is kind of concerning, but I do think that that will be interesting with him having that, um, need to have those conversations with rabbit um, that may bring about some sort of change. I don't know how good it's be or it will be. I will say the <laughs> prospect of three other novels actually gives me more hope for it, especially given their separation from the first one. Why are you guys both looking horrified at me? <laughs> I, guess, I don't know if I can do four like three more books i also, also don't know how in the world this book could end well, happily and then turn into three more books well like <laughs> well the thing is each of the the next three books all happen about a decade later and and something that i was wondering about <laughs> is you know we're talking about rabbit's view on women and this is happening in a time where the second wave of feminism hasn't even happened in American society yet. And that begins to happen at the height of the sixties. Yeah. And so by the time we get to the next novel, which I believe is in 1971, that second wave will have already occurred and will hopefully have shaped the dialogue of society enough to like make a change in Updike, therefore making a change in Rabbit. But I wouldn't guarantee that, but I would just think that like that separation of time <laughs> allows there to be more opportunity for growth as opposed to each of the four <laughs> Rabbit novels happening in 1960, <laughs> 61, 62, and 63. And it's just four novels. <laughs> and it's just four novels of Rabbit being exactly the same. Like, I just don't see that happening. Um, so that's something that I, I'm curious about. Um, and from what I've seen, this is an interesting concept, but like on Goodreads, the rating does go up per book. But Jamie and I also talked about this and I've thought about I don't know if this needs to be like a theory of like media criticism, but like the survivor's bias is I think what I've been kind of phrasing it as is that the more uh, you get deeper into a series of anything, you probably liked the one you probably before. yeah you you've already been committed that like you like it enough to continue on with it but also there are significant instances of like later um entries into a, 
a series getting worse reviews, but I don't know. I don't know what to make of that, but I do definitely subscribe somewhat to the survivor's <laughs> bias theory. That's what I'm dubbing it. But regardless, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see. I am still curious. Uh, I hope Janice does get more of a say. I hope she gets more of her own say. Again, I'm not optimistic about that, but I'd be curious. If to she see. doesn't, you'll hear me yelling <laughs> about, about it next, next time. About next episode. So. <laughs> Anyway, that's I think those are my final thoughts. Yeah, I am a little surprised at how excited I am to read the second half. <laughs> <laughs> because of like just objectively how kind of hard it was to get through like in terms of just like reading from Rabbit's point of view. Um but uh yeah, I I think that like reading the hard part about like reading all of these like um positive reviews from like newspapers, the positive reviews like praising Updike, like not a single one um has any kind of caveat. Like they're all just like <laughs> unphysically he's brilliant. He's phenomenal. There's nothing wrong with the way that he wrote. There's nothing wrong with the way he talked about women. Like nobody is self aware, which makes me pessimistic. You know, like none of these reviews are like, yeah, this is a lacerating story of loss and of seeking, but he was a raging misogynist, which like <laughs> On, on the back cover blurb, <laughs> he I was mean, a brilliant like, man. Kind of, kind of a piece of shit, though. I mean, he, I mean, like you know, everybody has flaws. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's like let's let's look at this through a critical lens. I think the problem is that like so many of the reviews are just like a circle jerk. I'll say it again. Um, I already said this <laughs> um, of just like praising Updike unequivocally and it's just kind of like did, did you not find like a single issue like you didn't even think it was a little problematic like <laughs> that is that is where it was hard for me to like but also maybe where i'm completely missing the point and updike will have a moment of clarity later i don't know um <laughs> but um i i'll finish with uh uh i'll bring back another thing that i um i I suspected when I read the summary of the book, which is, this really reminds me of um, Death of a Salesman. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is like the same, it's essentially like a clone of the same story. Um, it's, um, I mean, like, they're, they're the same, it's like a template, like, unhappy, like, relatively young man, like, flees his unhappy marriage, um, you know, like, not altogether because he's feeling like, wanderlusty and like you know romantic about the world but rather because he like hates his current situation and i was telling will earlier that like i don't think that this is a bad uh a bad like story i don't think this is a bad i think um i think i want to read tons of stories about people fleeing the like their unhappy lives and doing things that make them happy and doing things that like they want to do and like saying fuck the system but i think <laughs> you can do it without talking about how much you hate your wife. And <laughs> I would think that, like, I mean, I don't think a lot of author male authors in the 60s knew that was possible. Yeah. Or at least they didn't, they didn't write like they did. And it's so, also, it's been, a it's been a little while since I've read Death of a Salesman, but I do think that Death of a Salesman is more nuanced than what I have seen so far from Rabbit Run. Yeah, yeah, no, I would, I would agree with that. I, um, I think that like in terms the, the stories or the, the um uh the like impetus for running away is eerily similar yeah um or you know wanting to escape is eerily similar like um and so i um i i think that part of the reason um this felt a little bit like tired even to me is just because like we've seen it so many times already like a lot of people came after updike and i'm like there were people before him who like did the same thing and it's just kind of like all right let's find a new story about people running away from their boring lives without like talking about how much how ugly their wives are and like you know that being the straw that broke the camel's back um so i'm really excited to read the second half i'm <laughs> i'm 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 pumped um and uh i want to i want to i want to read up another quote um 
About Updike specifically. I believe this is from the Guardian article about uh, basically talking about um, the American, the, the, the all American story of men escaping women. Um, <laughs> Talking about Updike, no one can seem to agree on his surviving merits. He wrote like an angel, the consensus goes, except when he was writing like a malfunctioning sex robot attempting to administer cunnilingus to his typewriter. <laughs> Offensive criticism of him is often reductive, while defensive criticism has a strong flavor of people are being mean to my dad. Like, it feels, <laughs> it feels very, um, uh, like, I, I want to read more. I, I want to give up like, the, the credit that he deserves, but, like, I also, like, have a strong suspicion that he's a douche. Um, that's my final thought. <laughs> <laughs> I have a strong suspicion that he is a douche. Yeah, I End mean... episode. <laughs> all I'll say for, like, the, the other books of this, because, like, this is by far his most famous undertaking was the Rabbit series that I went to a co-worker's house safely six feet away to go pick up uh, just an ingredient that I needed. And I talked to my co-worker's husband on the porch and he, he's a writer, told him we were doing this tonight and he had reservations about Updike, but also had disclosed to me that he read all of them and like that there were merits there to it so uh, like i don't know i think that a lot of people from the discourse around updike like recognize the problematic aspect but like there are still <laughs> it makes me feel weird saying this after that <laughs> quote about the defense or whatever but like there are still merits there that are interesting and like it is interesting that all three of us are still excited to see what happens especially at the beginning when i specifically said to jamie I asked the question, I said, is this going to be this season's Vineland? <laughs> so, I don't know. That, so far, I don't think it is. No, I don't either. So, anyway, just wanted to, to bring that up. And, and uh, yeah, that will be the final thought. So, with that, we will have one more part uh, of Rabbit Run. That will be our next episode. We'll, we will have read the whole thing there. And then for next episode after that we're going to have a special guest um and we had just decided today on what the book is going to be so we'll reveal the guest later but the book is steppenwolf by herman hesse mm -hmm. um so that will be exciting it seems like it'll be our two guests will both be probably on the computer um so be two of us here in the room two on the computer but that will be the next one and then once we get into steppenwolf we'll start uh thinking about what our next pick is going to be for the three of us for the um second half of the second season so we'll have some more books for you all to read here pretty soon check out the instagram beard time with books we're on Podbean, we're on Spotify, we're on Apple Podcasts. Boom. Who wants to scat us out? I think I did it last time. Danny, we don't I don't know if we've had a computer scat. We need, <laughs> we need Oh, I'm going to do a computer scat. <laughs> we need a computer scat. <laughs> a squeep boopy. <laughs> a squeep squeeby. <laughs> we will Beautiful. catch you next time. <laughs> Bye. Bye.